going to start my speech by get, telling you guys a story. <laughs> I'm speaking on decision making today. Before I go into my lecture, I want to set some ground rules. Is that fair? Ground rules. Can we agree that God loves, loves every human being on earth equally? Can we agree? Dr. Ramunjai is here. She knows that every human being who's born, conceived, spends nine months, sometimes shorter, sometimes longer, in your mother's womb. And you're born with all your faculties in place. You're a mathematical miracle. Is that a fair statement? Every single person in this room, you're a mathematical miracle. Because for the nine months, one wrong calculation in how you're supposed to grow, something could go wrong. So the moment you're born, you're a miracle. You know what happens next? Everything after you're born, a miracle, is a collection of your decisions. Every human being that you meet, no matter the circumstance, what they become in life is a representation of their decisions. Their decisions. While you're under the care of your loved ones, because you're unable, it's their decisions that affect your life to a certain extent. But the moment you're old enough to know right from wrong, all your decisions, good or bad, will shape who you are. So there's no such thing as luck. There's no such thing as God loves us more. There's no such thing as Kidafma Sirintu, Ki Mung Manjiri. I was born poor. I was born with a silver spoon. It's decision making. So our country is a reflection of our decisions. Gambia, since 1956, 65, sorry, to where we are today, we're a reflection of our decisions. Our leaders, their decisions. Young people, their decisions. Middle-aged people, whatever that is, because Gambia, there's no in-between. Elderly, their decisions. We're a reflection of our decisions. So when we're talking about decision making, it's in the moments of your decision making that your destiny is shaped as a human being, good or bad. So my whole purpose today is to at least walk you guys through how I think decision making not only affects our lives, but the institutions that we belong to. But just remember that. God loves every human being. It's 4 o'clock, 4.30 when we started. Arguably, it's the most productive hour in the Gambia right now at 4.30. So the fact that you guys came here was a decision. When you arrived, the people that sat in front, that was a decision. What, the clothes you put on, that was a decision. The 30 minutes that you guys had before the lecture start, people that were on Instagram, Twitter, or reading class notes or doing something, that was a decision. So I want you, since we just talked about accountability, throughout the whole speech, I want you guys to see how every single decision affects your outcomes. But understand that decision making is how destiny is shaped. Uncle Tuff is a collection of all the decisions that he's made in his life. And I wanna thank him for giving an opportunity. You know what Uncle Tuff is doing? Uncle Tuff is a candle. You guys know a candle, right? Does a candle lose its brightness by lighting another candle next to it? Yes or no? Can, the, can a candle burn forever? But if a candle, can, the candle actually, the flame could burn forever. Because if one candle has 200 years, in that 200 years, which is a finite amount of time on Earth, it lights 2,000 flames. They take the accountability of lighting 2,000 flames. 10,000 years later, one flame 
of a human being who lit another candle could burn forever. Which is why the speech that you guys heard when it says, to whom much is given, much is expected. The Taft Leadership Academy is where candles are lit. So you guys have a responsibility to keep Uncle Taft's flame ablaze for generations to come. Because this is the future of Gambia. Who am I? I'm just a collection of my decisions. It's decision making. So I'm just going to tell you who I am through the decisions in my life. Right? I moved back to Gambia when I was seven years old. My parents made a decision. You know what? Let's put you in those comprehensive because it'll be an easier transition. That was a decision. I left Ndaus at grade nine. My dad took me out of Ndaus and took me to Gambia High. That was a decision. He was like, you are abroad. You've experienced private school. Public school is a different reality. I think going to public school will add character to your life. It did. I went to Gambia High. What happens at grade nine or 10, which I'm not a fan of, they tell you arts, commerce, or science. That was a decision. Who could guess what I chose? I'm in the medical field. I chose science. That was a decision. When I graduated from high school, the first decision I made was I wanted to be a civil engineer. That was a decision. I got to Tennessee State University in the US. Two weeks of engineering? Nope. Another decision. I changed my de decision to chemistry. Because at that time, I realized I really like science. I love chemistry. Let me start with chemistry. And chemistry is a foundation degree that could put me in any medical field. So in that moment of decision making, I'm going to explain how certain de decisions differ. It could be operational decisions. It could be tactical decisions. It could be strategic decisions. I want you guys to remember that. Operational, tactical, and strategic. Operational is what time do you go to bed at night if you don't want to be late? How many of you guys have a checklist that you use every single day? Things that you do. What time you brush your teeth, hopefully twice a day, right? Reading at least 30 minutes a day. Those are operational things. So even institutions, there's certain things at Taf, Uncle Taft's company that operationally, it's happening, right? Those are everyday routine things, but they're all decisions. Do I want to go to bed at 11 so that I could have eight hours of sleep? Or do I want to talk on the phone till 1 AM and be tired and be late? Which is why, going back to late, I, I never excuse lateness. Because that's a decision. It's a choice. But that's operational decision. Tactical decisions are not long term. Operational short term, you do it every day. So prime example, a tactical decision is if you're a university student, what classes do I want to take this semester? That's a tactical decision. Right or wrong, you could order correct, right? Strategic decisions, those are visionary. Those are long term. Who do I choose to marry? Strategic decision. Don't believe that love stuff. Strategy. <laughs> Strategy. What career do I want to choose? Strategy, long term. What institution do I want to work for? Strategy, long term. These are things that if you do not gather the right information when you're making the decision, it'll cost you. And that's why individuals around you who are strategic thinkers you should always be a sponge when you're around them. You heard what Ms. Daffy just mentioned about Uncle Tough. Strategic. A lot of young people, they come to you like, could you be my mentor? Okay, what do you want me to mentor you on? Yeah, I could be your mentor, but on what? People like Fadi and Mamar, I know them. I respect them. You know why? They're strategic. So my conversation is like, Fadi, help me understand 
how you make decisions in your company. That's a fruitful conversation. How do you seek information? How do you process that information? So, and do additional research. These are things that you have to build on. Operational decision making, strategic vision, vision uh, decision making, and tactical, which is in the middle. If we had anybody in the military right now, they'll tell you the military specialize in tactical decision making because they have to make decisions sometimes with incomplete information, which as a leader in institutions, everybody will tell you, I know I'm not the best decision maker. If anything, before I make certain decisions, I ask enough people who are better decision makers than I am to make sure I don't have any blind spots. Take it from me, a lot of them, I see them in the room. I'll call them like, hey, Hadi, this decision that I'm about to make could have an implication on 65 individuals in the Gambia. I don't trust the information I have. When was the last time any one of you guys, before you made a critical decision in your life, looked in the mirror and knew you did not have the information to make a decision and stopped before making the decision? By a raise of hands, anybody who practices that? This is something I really have to do. I really think I want to be a doctor. But you see Dr. Romanjai every single time and you never ask her, how did you choose to become a doctor? Information. I work a lot with young people. So I know every single tendency that people used to tell me about before I came to the Gambia. Whew, I thought they were dialing it down. We're not hungry for information. We're raised in a very centralized decision-making culture. You guys know what centralized is? We sit on our hands and wait to act. All a decision is, if I walk up, I could go right, I could go left. If I know this path leads to good things on the other end, this path is uncertain. I have to make a decision. But as a culture, they could even show us what's here and what's here, and we'll still come to this point and wait in the, ah, Uncle Tafu, how my dad are Am I lying? Every organization. We struggle because our, even in our homes, it's centralized. Our schools are centralized. You sit until they tell you what to do, even if you have all the information. So part of transformational leadership, I think we have to have a culture of decentralizing decision making. And I've just transitioned from the tactical, strategic, and operation to talk about two different things, centralized decision making and decentralized dis decision making. Any institution in the world that functions well has a decentralized decision-making scheme. A lot of things that doesn't work about Gambia because one person who has to sign a check could hold up a process for 10 business days because Tobaski happened on a Wednesday. Gambia, you know we love our public holidays. So Monday was salam, Thursday was salam, Friday 12 o'clock is gone. So a lot of our institutions are centralized in decision making. When what a decentralized decision making process looks like is, if Uncle Tuff is, has access to the company's accounts, there's a check that is for $5,000. He has access to the accounts, and the bank account says there's $10,000 in the account. And he knows that this check is for Mr. Jones, who is our vendor, we've received the products. Decentralized decision making is Uncle Taf realizing, okay, this vendor is valid, there's money in the bank account, he signs, the process moves. Does that make sense? Right? But if a vendor who he does not know arrives, now he's missing information. 
So in that moment of decision making, he cannot proceed until he gets what? Information. Decision making is a science. There's an art to decision making. But I need you guys, especially as young leaders of tomorrow, to understand the art of decision making. And there's a lot of key elements to decision making that you need to start auditing in your own lives. The friends you hang around, decisions. And it's baffling sometimes. When you see individuals, every single time they're complaining about this friend. You see people, every single time they're complaining about this job. But every day they go show up to the same job. Or every Friday evening they're around the same friend. Are they held captive? Or are they just making the decision to keep them around? So you guys see how accountability and decision making is like peanut butter and jelly. They go together. Audit your lives. Every day, I need you guys to start asking what, why, how. Everything you do. Ask yourself, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? How am I going to do it? What, how, why? And when, if it's relevant. If every human being masters the art of using those questions before they make any decision in life, you'll be a better decision maker. What am I doing, as in what's the intent? Why am I here? Why are you guys here today? How am I going to do it? Just ask those questions. It makes it a whole lot easier. Something else that I'm going to touch on when it comes to the art of decision making is choice. Who knows what, what's the difference between a decision and a choice? What's normally missing is information. With a decision, you have implications. Choice could be a preference. Right? Some people like color red, some people like color blue. The implications are little, right? But decisions, when you have multiple options, right? The decision on which option to choose or which direction to, go, to do has implications on the other end. That could be positive or negative. Does that make sense? A decision, whatever you decide to do. On the other side, you have multiple options. On the other side of those options, it could be positive, negative, or neutral. So what happens when you get to that end and you find out what the outcome is? Who knows what's next? You analyze the outcome. So there's a theory of continuous improvement cycles. Something else I want you guys to remember. Plan, do, study, act. Plan, do, study, act. Plan, weighing out your options. Three candidates that show up for an interview. Who do I hire? What goes into the planning? Reviewing their resumes. Somebody shows up five minutes late, X. Somebody shows up for a job interview, not dressed properly, X. Right? Somebody giving you excuses or even late. X. Is that a bad or a good decision? It's intuition. Ah. You're unemployed and you're late. It's madness. It's madness. You don't have a job and you're late. But you're analyzing the options, you're planning. The doing you act. The moment you act, you study the outcome. Every good decision maker has a list of bad decisions that they've made in their life. God knows I'm one of them. 
Some people who really know me when I was a child would tell you this guy has turned out to be a fine gentleman with God when he was young. I've made a lot of bad decisions in my life. But you know what I'm addicted to in that continuous process? Studying. Studying. They say the first one is for you. The second one is on you. Does that make sense? To err is human. We're all fallible human beings. But the first one is for you to learn, to study, to reflect, to be honest with yourself. If you do that properly, the second one could never happen. Because the moment you come to a point of decision again, what have you done? You've studied. So you could act on it, and that's how you become a better decision maker. You could ask any leader on this table. We have a list because the bad decisions we remember. But any good leader is a leader who could autocorrect and be better from it. So even if you came to this session today thinking that I've made some bad decisions in my life, study them. You'll know your tendencies if you're honest with yourself. You'll know what you need to fix if you're honest with yourself or you have honest people around you. So even once you make a decision and it works, study the outcome of the decision because you're going to need it again. So you plan, weigh out your options. You do it. Action. Action. It's like our country. Policy, flawless. Workshop, flawless. Seminar, flawless. Tough Leadership Academy, flawless. Lecturers, flawless. What are you going to act on? How many of you guys tomorrow are going to take an accountability checklist based on the speech you heard? How many of you guys are going to start writing on a piece of paper, plan, do, act, study on every single decision? We're a country of planners. But planning is only as good as the Air Force size paper that's on it. Results don't come out of it. So you have to plan the decision that you want to make. You have to do it. You have to do it. Even if you have a responsibility to do something and you feel like you don't have the information required to do it, then you stop and seek information. And I'll tell you, as a leader in a company, I don't trust human beings. I know that sounds weird. We're all fallible. I trust decision makers. I trust people based on their ability to make decisions, with or without me in the institution. The good people that I have in our organization, they make the decision and they'll never get to me because they know as a company, these are the standards, these are, these are the procedures, this is what good looks like. So I don't need to call Ismaila to ask him if we forgot to deliver a medication on time, I should call and apologize to the patient and make sure it gets delivered that particular day. That's a decision they don't need me for. So I don't trust those human beings. I trust their ability to make a decision. But if Uncle Taft's secretary writes a message, wants me to speak today, they're not going to tell the person, yes, he's going to be there at 5 PM. They won't make that decision. They'll be like, OK, let me seek more information and confirm, and I'll call you back. So as you guys enter the workforce or become leaders, just understand that people are going to trust your ability to make decisions or not. That's how far you're going to get it in your career. Those are the people who get promoted faster. Because now going back to what she says, if she's spending a small percentage of her time thinking strategically, she could have able people who are able to make good decisions and now frees her up to do things that have more value. So every individual in here, you are going to be evaluated in life and rewarded 
based on the quality of your decision making. It's very rare do you see people who are extremely successful in life that it's because of luck. No, they, they're good decision makers. But if you ask them, they learn more from the, the decisions that they did not make right and use it as jet fuel to propel them to the next level. So honestly, when it comes down to it, the decisions you make today, the decisions you make tomorrow, will determine the outcome of your life, the outcome of your family's life, the outcome of this country. If not the next generation, they were still gonna be having a lot of individuals who get all the information available, but yet still we're not being captains of our faith and masters of our soul. Because at the end of the day, going back to where I began, every single person in here is a miracle. Every single person in this world is God's instrument. Information is free in this day and age. What decisions are you going to make to transform your life you transform your life, you transform your family's life, you transform your nation's outcomes. It all comes down to your decisions that you make as well. And have character. Once you understand what your moral values are, decisions become easier. You guys know that, right? As an adult, the moment you establish who you are and what you're not, decisions come easy because you have a code. And you guys remember, I talked about this when I was on Uncle Taft's hub. Age doesn't matter. I'm glad Ajikuma mentioned what she did. I think more young people like discipline. More young people look at accountability as oppression. I'm not old. I'm telling you my lived experiences. The average Gambian young person sees accountability as oppression. The average young people thinks entrepreneurship comes before apprenticeship. You could see a 25-year-old Gambian who has had 10 jobs because we are addicted to instant gratification. Our brain is wired for instant gratification. I have yet to meet a Gambian who is under 28 who has had less than two, two jobs in the past five years. Fadi knows because they leave Fadi, they see in Overex, they put in an application. They just job hop. So what moral character are you going to instill to guide your decision-making process? Because once it's known, your institution is always a reflection of the leader from a moral character standpoint. So at Innovarex Global, any flaw in my moral character will be embedded in the company's DNA. So, which is why my leaders make decisions now based on what's the understood element of my moral character. That's one thing I want you guys to go home with. Once you understand what your moral character is, decision making becomes easier. And we will be a reflection, even if I'm 80 years old, the fate of this country will be left in the hands of our decision makers. And that's you guys. I thank you guys.